Hello, I'm Dr Nigel Guillaume, Course Director for Mental CSA Courses. I've been involved in delivering postgraduate medical education, specifically the MRCGP, since 2002. I work as a GP trainer in North West London and I'm also a Programme Director for the St Mary's Scheme, which is part of the London Deanery. I work also as a lecturer in general practice and senior OSCE examiner for King's College School of Medicine. What follows is a synopsis of a presentation that I give my own trainees and those who attend the course on how to approach the CSA. Further resources and information can be found on the website at the end of this presentation, but for now I do hope you find it useful and helpful in your preparation. So let's start with the definition of the purpose of the CSA, an assessment of a doctor's ability to integrate and apply appropriate clinical, professional, communication and practical skills in general practice. But what does this actually entail and how do you encompass it when preparing for the CSA? One of the biggest challenges that my own trainees come to me with is that they can't see the CSA as real because it's an exam situation and they get very nervous. And then nervous anxiety takes over. Indeed, I see this a lot what happens when we're nervous? Well what happens is that we start adopting rigid consultation behaviours, we ask questions out of context, they don't seem real, they don't indeed feel real, they feel wooden and synthetic and generic and that simply will not work in the CSA. What you're being assessed on here is whether it appears real, whether you appear real and whether this is what you would really do in real life general practice indeed anywhere in the country. However, this is not typical general practice because in typical general practice you have the luxury of running over 10 minutes, you don't necessarily have to have an outcome at the end, and you can always have that golden minute of silence if you wish. However, the CSA is a costly exam. Each minute that you're in there costs you about £12 or so, so you need to make cost-effective use of your time if you're simply going to stay quiet and expect to get lots of responses to questions such as tell me more, any other symptoms, what were your expectations from this consultation today asked out of context, I'm afraid to say you're going to be sorely disappointed. This is about having a focused consultation, not just a chat. It's not enough just to be nice, you have to have structure with that. The analogy is the consultation as a journey. You are the driver, the patient is the passenger, and together you will share that journey, but ultimately the responsibility of the driving will rest upon you. So is the CSA a tick box exercise? Absolutely not, I'm afraid to say. There are simply just no ticks for asking ideas, concerns and expectations out of context. Or indeed, do you smoke? Do you drink? Who lives with you at home? What do you do for work? If it's got nothing to actually do with the case at all. And if you think about it, if these were just simple generic questions that you could ask of any case and expect to get points, then there would be no challenge of doing the CSA at all. The challenge here is about building this into your consultation so that you take a fluent psychosocial history. How is this actually affecting you? Is it affecting you at work? Is it affecting you at home? So that you understand the narrative behind the patient. And also elicitation of the health belief in a fluent way. It's difficult when you're nervous. You're trying to solve the problem, engage the patient, but ultimately it has to feel real. Because if it doesn't feel real, you won't, in fact, be able to pass so the CSA, I'm afraid, doesn't actually look like this. You don't have a nice, smiley examiner who's happy to give you your examination findings if you simply ask for them. Then the invisible man, the invisible woman, in fact, the only person that really matters is the patient. So don't look to the examiner for acknowledgement because you might be sorely disappointed. Just get on and focus on the patient, as you would do in everyday life. A few practicalities. You have 13 patients, 10 minutes each, and 2 minutes break in between. There's also a break halfway through, all the cases will be marked, and as a general rule of thumb, you stay put and everyone comes to see you. You've got all the notes to start off with, and typically this will just be a name and an age. Each case is marked by a different examiner as they rotate with their patients. It is 10 minutes and 10 minutes only. At least three cases will require physical examination, but as a general rule of thumb, anything physical that presents, even if it's a follow-up, will require physical examination and this will encompass in fact about six to seven cases in the CSA. So how are cases selected? Well in fact if you look at any case it's going to be mapped to a particular aspect of your curriculum. You're going to have physical cases of course but you'll also have cases that cover ethical areas as well. 
However, primarily it's the third column that you're being assessed on, which is your management of how to deal with the uncertain. That is what we specialise in, dealing with anything that walks in through the door and being perceived to do so with confidence. You're being assessed here on your technique. There's a bank now of over 800 cases which the RCGP can choose from. You are simply not going to pass by case regurgitation, but only through practicing and perfecting your technique, which you'll need to do by seeing lots of patients, having objective feedback with your trainer, and also through study groups. You've got to remember that you may know everything there is to know about atrial fibrillation, but do you know everything about the patient who has atrial fibrillation? A generic speech about atrial fibrillation is simply not going to work. You're going to be assessed on how you talk with patients rather than at patients. So this isn't about just what you say, in fact it's much more about how you say it which is very important. Presentation here is totally key. Every patient that you see is different and so you're going to have to be flexible in how you respond and react to patients' agendas. Make sure that you're always seen to be talking with patients, that's the most important aspect of the CSA. And if you're able to encompass that in how you practice, you should be fine. A few quick pointers on the marking schedule of the CSA. This can be found in detail on the RCGP website, but in essence each case is marked in three domains, data gathering, clinical management and interpersonal skills. These three domains are split into 16 statements, and we'll talk about these statements a bit later on in the presentation. However, they are available on your ePortfolio when the results are published, and you'll be given feedback according to these statements. All domains have equal weighting. There are four grades awardable, ranging from a clear pass, which carries a score of 3, to a clear fail, which doesn't carry any points at all. That's then turned into a score, so there are 9 points per case. There's 117 in total for the circuit. You'll then be assessed globally as to whether you're a pass, borderline or fail on the day, and then a pass mark for each sitting is determined by the borderline group method. This pass mark is available on your ePortfolio once the results are published. So let's talk a little bit more about those who will clear pass. For me, someone who clear passes is someone who knows how to manage their own nervous anxiety. They can turn it into something very positive, they show intuition, they listen to everything a patient has to say, and they follow up on cues almost immediately. The narrative builds up very quickly between the trainee doctor and the patient to the point where it does feel more like a narrative as opposed to a rigid consultation. They're able to involve the patient every step of the way, um, all the time showing structure uh, and self-awareness. Someone who is marginally passing is a doctor who knows how to take a good focused history. The first half is solid. What tends to happen in the second half is that they latch on to something, be it atrial fibrillation, hypertension, or whatever they feel the working diagnosis is and the patient actually gets talked at rather than with. It's very important that the second half is as patient-centered as the first if you want to do well. Someone who is marginally failing is showing rigidity in how they approach the consultation. Questions such as ideas, concerns and expectations are asked totally out of context, often right at the start of the consultation before the presenting complainant is even acknowledged. In this way it appears synthetic, wooden and rigid. The patient isn't really listened to. Someone who is clear failing is showing a lot of negative behaviours. There's very poor structure to the consultation, indeed no focus at all in the first half. In the second half the doctor is not in control of the consultation at all, there is no outcome at the end and in fact the patient is not listened to, cues are not followed up, the agenda is not addressed in any way. So let's look at the top tips in how to actually pass. Well, I teach my own trainees a six to four minute rule when it comes to cases of physical diagnostic uncertainty. Let's start off with the first six minutes of the consultation. We've talked about the importance of a good focused history. It's very important to realize that a question such as tell me more is not likely to elicit very much in a CSA context and the reason for this is that CSA role players are primed to give you information but only if specifically asked in the right way and in the right context. So simply asking tell me more is only likely to evoke a response such as what is it that you would like to know.
Rather than tell me more, try something like this, which is still an open question. Could you tell me how it all started? This will actually start a narrative. You'll start to engage a patient in a much more fluent manner. You're then going to be able to start asking good specific questions, specifically looking at red flags. Do signpost your questions, especially if they have to cover sensitive areas such as a sexual health history. The golden rule here is that if you don't ask, you will not get. It's very important that you do ask a psychosocial history, but not simply what do you do for work, who lives with you at home, do you smoke, do you drink. What you're interested in is the narrative. How is this affecting you at work, at home? It is equally important to explore health beliefs and agendas, the patient's perspective. Now often if you've engaged the patient this will become apparent in the narrative and all you have to do is simply acknowledge it. But if it hasn't, then do ask. Had you any thoughts, any concerns as to what was causing this headache, for example, if headache is what we're dealing with? What's much more important though is acknowledging what comes back. That is what makes you patient-centered, is the acknowledgement and following up of what actually comes back once you've asked that question. Because if you simply ask ideas, concerns and expectations as a tick and see it as a tick, it will have no meaning at all. You then want to summarize. Our summary before our examination will encompass one, whether we've covered our red flags, two, a psychosocial history and context, three, a health belief and four, acknowledgement of that patient perspective, that patient narrative. Now do remember that the sole purpose here of a summary is in fact for you because if you haven't covered those things then actually you're not ready to move on to the second half of the consultation. It's very important that you've encompassed all of that before you then undertake a focused examination. And a focused examination it does have to be which shows fluency and proficiency. Don't look here to the examiner for acknowledgement. You might be very sorely disappointed. Just get on and do what you would do in everyday life. If you want to do a cardiac exam, an ENT exam, an eye exam, get on and do that. Show fluency and proficiency, not in just how you examine, but how you use your medical instruments, because this is all going to be part of your data gathering. So now we enter the second half of the consultation, the remaining four minutes. It's very important that you preempt the readdressment of the health belief. So if a patient has come to you and said with a headache at the start of the consultation, I'm quite worried it's a brain tumour, you must readdress this in the second half. You must preempt it. Explain why you think it may not be a brain tumour. Show reassurance in what you're doing. Justify why it's not the case. You have to share and be transparent with your decision making and problem solving processes, but you're going to have to make a commitment. Do consider as a first level of commitment, is this serious or is this not? Try and work towards the probability of what's happening. The analogy here is, for example, getting into a swimming pool. You've got the shallow end and the deep end, and you and the patient are going to have to both get into the swimming pool together. You may not want to just jump into the deep end because you might sink. So commit sensitively at the shallow end, consider is this serious or is this not, and together with the patient try and make your way up towards the deep end. Now it's very important that you share sensible patient management options. Being patient-centered simply isn't about giving lots of options and I'm going to talk about that more in the next slide. If you think about any clinical scenario you'll generally realize if you think about something that you've done in practice recently there aren't lots of options and even if there are a couple of options usually one option stands above the rest. So it's important to make this an informed choice. Consider risk versus benefit of any management decision that you're undertaking. Consider patient safety. Throughout all of this though you're going to have to show self-awareness, sensitivity and support. Positive energy is a term that we really encompass on the course and something that I try and teach my trainees because the power of transference in the consultation cannot be underestimated. If you can be very supportive in your approach then that patient journey is going to be one that a patient is going to remember for all the right reasons. The most important thing when presenting a management plan is to keep it simple. Sometimes one of the only options is to send a patient to hospital. Keep it simple and supportive. If you're going to keep it in primary care, always remember to follow it up. Always remember to safety net it. And do leave yourself enough time in the CSA to undertake that. At the heart of being patient-centered is patient acknowledgement. Confucius once said, do not worry if people do not understand you, worry if you do not understand them. 
and this stands very true when it comes to acknowledging the patient perspective. If you're simply asking the question but not actually appreciating what comes back, not showing sincerity and self-awareness, then you won't be patient-centered. You won't appear to have acknowledged the patient's perspective and you won't have established the rapport that you need to move on in the consultation. So the acknowledgement of the patient perspective is key in being patient-centered, but it is also about informed choice. It isn't simply giving three or four options and asking the patient to choose one. That is not patient-centeredness. That will lead to dangerous patient-driven medicine, because if those options are not informed, if you haven't shared the information as to what the relative benefit, relative risk of a particular option is, then the patient might choose an option that really isn't in their best interests, and they haven't been informed really with regards to that. Your job is to facilitate that discussion. In order to do that you have to take a holistic approach and inevitably in the CSA it will take the form of negotiation. One of the key rules here is that if you find something being repeated to you in the CSA it is because you haven't addressed the agenda. It's very important that you stop at that point realize that things are being repeated and try and take a different direction in order to address the agenda and move the consultation forward. Take for example a clinical scenario where a patient with chest pain comes to see you. It's going up their neck, down their left arm and they've got the chest pain as they're talking. There is only one option, you need to send them into hospital. However, what if a patient says to you, I don't want to go to hospital? Do you simply go along with that. Does that make you patient-centered? No, it does not. What makes you patient-centered is acknowledging the fact that the patient's probably very scared. No one likes going to hospital, especially if it's something very serious. So acknowledge that, share it, and appreciate it as the doctor. It's very important to be patient-centered by displaying empathy and support. Facilitate discussion and negotiation with the patient sensitively by explaining the potential benefit of getting the patient to hospital as soon as possible to sort out what sounds like an MI, as opposed to the potential risk of letting that patient go home and deteriorate, which could indeed be life-threatening. It's so important to remember how to smile, even under exam conditions. My own daughters, Heather and Ruby, remind me of that every day. I think in the CSA, try and remember that Establishing rapport doesn't take a handshake. In fact, you wouldn't shake the hands of every patient that walked into your surgery every morning or indeed afternoon. However, you do try and smile, even when you're tired, because you don't want to transfer anything that's happened in the last consultation into the one that's going to begin. So remember that. Smile, good eye contact, and know how to control the tone of your voice to good effect. So let's summarise. I would encourage you to remember my S approach to the CSA. Do try and smile. Have some fun with it. Self-awareness, sensitivity and sincerity. Imagine what it's like if you were in the patient's shoes. Show sympathy when it requires you to do so. However, don't try and act empathic because it will simply be an act. Try and get yourself into the moment and just be empathic. Show structure to your history and clinical management. Be specific in your line of questioning, which is going to take some signposting, especially if you're covering sensitive areas. Do share your findings and thoughts. Summarize. Safety net. Keep it simple, and most importantly, keep it supportive. And so now we come to the 16 statements that the college will look at when they come to assess you, and also when they come to give you feedback once the results are published to the portfolio. I'm not going to run through all of these in detail as they can be found on the RCGP website and also on my website passmrcgp.com. I've underlined in particular the red statements which STs have found difficulty with. I would like to draw your attention though to statement 10 which is does not attempt to promote good health at opportune times in the consultation. Do remember that just because you found out that a patient is a smoker, do not get drawn into giving them a lecture on smoking cessation in the first half of the consultation. In order for this to succeed, and if it is appropriate, bring it in only during the second half of the consultation as part of your clinical management when you can make it pertinent and relevant to the actual presenting complaint. And do be sensitive with how you deliver this message and supportive. 
you will also realize that there is a much greater weighting on the statements around the interpersonal skills which became apparent when the marking scheme changed in September 2010. This really follows on from the fact that candidates have failed to see this exam as real. You need to see the role player very much as a real patient. In order to do this, just imagine what you would do in real life in your everyday practice. Once you engage that person as a real patient, you're going to start listening, you are going to break out of those rigid tick box approaches, and you'll start understanding where the patient's coming from. That is totally key in passing the CSA. I'll leave you with a Confucian quote, failure lies not in falling down but in not getting up. The CSA won't always necessarily go as planned, but it's very important that you pick yourself up if you've had a bad station and make sure that you don't bring any negative energy into the following one. Do stay positive, do try and push forward and try and keep smiling. It's time now really to put the theory into practice. My last message here is do try and be yourselves. Don't try and be a CSA robot. Most importantly, be good to yourselves. When it comes to the CSA, you can be your own best friend or your own worst enemy. So stay positive. We've now come to the end of the presentation. I do hope that you found it useful. All that's left for me to say is the very best of luck in your preparation. It's very important that you put the theory into practice by seeing as many patients as you can do, getting objective feedback from your trainer, and if possible, starting a study group early on into your ST3 year. Video recording of your consultations during clinic and also during your study group sessions is a very powerful way of enhancing self-awareness. I would definitely recommend that you undertake this during your preparation for the exam. Further resources can be found on my website, passmrcgp.com, and do feel free to contact me by email anytime at mrcgpcourses at yahoo.com. Under the resources section of my website, you'll find this presentation as a podcast, and you'll also find two mental CSA consultation videos. These will form part of my online bank of mental CSA consultations, which will be available for subscribing to in the near future. Do feel free to join us at Facebook Mentor Medicine and check the website for regular updates. If you feel you'd like to put the theory into practice, do consider coming on a course, and if you wish to come on one, please contact me. I look forward to meeting you then. Otherwise, very best wishes. <laughs>